and I had bullets go right over me and my buddy's heads hitting the wall right behind us from this guy. And then we ended up shooting the guy 62 times. I grew up playing golf down in South Georgia since I was eight years old, played all through middle school and high school. And uh, it was about my senior year. I really had a senior year of high school where I really wanted to kind of serve and do something extra. And uh, I was doing really well in golf and I received a golf scholarship to Darton College in Albany, Georgia, which at the time was the number one junior college for golf. And so I did, I was supposed to join the Marines at 17. My dad didn't want me to do that. He wanted me to go and experience college and, you know, enjoy the golf and, and do that whole deal. And so I did, I went and played college golf for a year, was won a couple of, won one event and finished second team all American. And um, I got a, I received another scholarship to come back the following year. But instead of doing that, you know, I decided uh, it was time for me to try something else. I kind of got burnt out on the game, and mm. so I ended up joining the Marines. So I gave up a, a full-ride golf scholarship to join the Marines in 2010. And it was so crazy. At least to me, it wasn't that crazy, but it was so crazy to everyone else that they even did a news article on me. So a local news channel came and interviewed me for the news, and they did a whole paper on it. It's, it's still online somewhere. Yeah. And uh, everyone just thought I was insane and crazy. And my coach at the time was doing all he could to try and keep me uh, to, to come back the next year. But I, I was done. I was wanting to join the Marines. Wow. And two days after Nationals in, in Arizona, I left and went to Paris Island. So at first, I was going to join the Army. Um, I was really wanting to join the Army. But the recruiter wasn't in the office at the time, but the Marine recruiter was. And he was wearing his uh, the dress blue deltas. He's, at the time, he was a staff sergeant, and he was jacked. He was a big guy, and I was like, dang, that's what I want to be. I want to look just like him. So I went in there, and he was a machine gunner, actually. That's what his MOS was, and he sat me down, and, you know, you pull out the little cards and, you know, the four things that you want, physical fitness, discipline, initiative, all that stuff, and he had me pick out the tags, and he really told me, you know, how the Marines operate, uh, that you don't join them, you know, they, they, they come get you. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, of course you can volunteer to go in there, but you have to prove that you're worth it. And I wanted to prove that I was, I had the ability to do it. Mm. And when someone tells you, you know, you're not good enough or you won't make it, that kind of makes you want to do it more. Yeah. So that's what I loved about the Marines. So when I was 17, I was trying to go to boot camp. <clears throat> After my senior year, right before going to college in the fall of 2000 and uh, of 2009, at the time I graduated in 09, and uh, it was such a, a big deal. I was arguing with them so much that I was trying to get my parents to sign the waiver to allow me to go to boot camp. I was going to be a reservist. I was going to be a warehouse clerk as a reservist in Albany, Georgia, where I was going to college at the time to play co college golf. So I was kind of trying to work with them on that. My dad got, me and my dad got in such a big argument. <laughs> Instead of punching him, I turned around, punched the microwave, completely caved in the front of the microwave. I thought it was plastic. It, it's not plastic in the front, it's actually glass. It's very hard. So I ended up breaking my, uh, I guess you call it a boxer's, boxing yeah, fracture. Right. And I didn't get to play at least half the season of my oh. senior year of high school golf. And everybody called me an idiot for that. And that. I mean, that was just how much passion I had to, to want to join the Marines. Wow. So my first four years after um, graduating boot camp, I was at 0311 stationed with 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. Um, I was one of nine out of my uh, SOI class. So everyone else went to 1-3 and 3rd Marines in Hawaii. And then myself and eight other guys got stationed in North Carolina which I was super grateful for because it was about an eight, nine hour drive back home to Georgia. I was able to go mm -hmm. home a few times and I was, I was still in the South and um, where, you know, I love the most, still able to do fishing and hunting. And so I did uh, first four years, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, Alpha Company. I did uh, two tours to Afghanistan, one in 2011, one in 2013 to 14, and then I did one tour to Kuwait mm. as a... Wow. Uh, I became a team leader right after my first deployment in 2011. We went to Marja. Um, 
I was very fortunate, very lucky to have very good uh, chain of command. And uh, I think my upbringing kind of had a, a role in allowing me to become a team leader. I was just a 19-year-old Lance Corporal, um, never deployed before, didn't have any experience really. But about three months into my uh, deployment at the time, my team leader unfortunately suffered. He became a really bad heat casualty, you know, because Afghanistan is super hot. Mm -hmm. And instead of allowing someone else more senior to become a team leader, they were like, all right, McQuaig, because I was a saw gunner. And uh, they're like, all right, McQuaig, we're going to give you your shot. You're now the team leader. And we had a good four months left of that deployment. And uh, I was 19 years old in charge of people older than me and oh. as a team leader yeah and uh i felt like i did you know okay doing that i was very nervous all the time trying to figure out what to do and right you go from the saw and they give you your m16 203 and and uh that kind of really after that really made me love the marine corps even more mm. so in, in marja at the time and you only know so much as a, as a lance corporal we were kind of just going around using this system called the hide system where we were going around taking fingerprints taking pictures of people and uh, we were just on a patrol base my company was actually attached to third battalion sixth marines in south marja uh, bravo charlie company were up north in nawa district and uh, so we were actually completely separate from ninth, ninth marines at the time we fell under three six and uh, during that deployment we never saw any action for seven months, mm -hmm. sleeping in a tent, not able to shower, <clears throat> holes all in your camis, you don't even wear underwear. The only things you really, you know, cherish are socks, you know, the ability to brush your teeth. And yeah. we didn't have running water, we just had a pump. So anytime we would wash our clothes, we'd take whatever body wash we, could, we would have and put it in a bucket with, you know, the nasty Afghanistan river water and you try and do the best you can with what you got. and. Mm -hmm. um, but our mission there was just, you know, to deter the enemy. There was one bridge crossing, one bridge crossing that we would uh, check people, you know, for any explosive residue or weapons or yeah. anything, IED making materials. And unfortunately, during that time, there really wasn't much fighting going on. I say unfortunately because, you know, it is a yeah. fortunate thing that there yeah. wasn't fighting. But, you know, as a Marine. Unfortunate for a Marine, but in reality, it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No one got really, no one got hurt. And yeah, it was, it was, that's good. It was okay. Really. I didn't see much action till my third deployment mm -hmm. in, uh, 2013 where we were stationed out of camp Leatherneck and went back to Afghanistan again. And this was kind of when the drawdown was happening. Mm -hmm. Now during that time I was a squad leader. I was a corporal. Um, I had a little more experience and knew a little bit more about what I was doing. And, uh, we were, mobile we had two MRAPs and two mat v's for every patrol we would patrol out of camp leatherneck and uh, we would we would go out and try and find rocket emplacements that the taliban would use to shoot rockets at mm -hmm. camp leatherneck we only had maybe from what i remember maybe two or three rocket attacks happen and they didn't even come close but uh, i guess you would say i gotten a little bit complacent so when we're doing our rip with the uh prior battalion you know i was going out with the other squad leaders and it was just myself and i think two other squad leaders attached to 28 which was the previous unit and it was my first day there outside the wire and we were following one of the local uh nationals from one building to another it was about 100 yards in between we followed him and all was safe you know you felt real good when the locals would kind of guide you through so you didn't step on any ids or you knew you weren't going to get shot at then we went, he, we went to his house, searched his house. There was nothing. Now it's time to load up and get out of there and uh, leave from that guy's house. Well, we didn't have a local national escorting us this time. And we were, we were on foot. And all of a sudden, I see the two eight Marines in front of me just start sprinting across from house to house. I'm like, guys, it's super hot. Like, there's no need. There's no enemy in the area. We don't need any sprinting. Well, lo and behold, I didn't know. I step outside that doorway of that mud hut, and then I start just hearing these shots going off from my left and just you know hear the ak round shooting and your blood gets to pumping and i'm like no way this is really happening at one time at one time i was kind of 
scared, and this is all happening within a 10 second time frame. I was a little scared, then I was also super excited. I was like, yes, finally, I get to pop my cherry, I get to... And then when I turned to shoot back with my M4, the Taliban were so smart that they shot at us with the sun behind them. So when I went to look through my ACOG, it just completely mm -hmm. wided out, I couldn't see anything. And they were super, super smart. Luckily at that time, they only fired maybe 10 to 12 rounds, nobody, nobody got hit. But after that, we went to uh, you know, search and find out where they came from. Apparently, they throw down rugs. They would throw down rugs, shoot off that, so they could pick up all the brass afterwards. You wouldn't know where they came from. Mm -hmm. And then that was my first day of the last deployment. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is going to be a long deployment. <laughs> then the, the next day, I finally got to you know, return fire and, and shoot back. And um, I remember this pretty vividly. And I was still learning you know, the TTPs in the local area of what the Taliban were doing. And we were just doing a security haul with four vehicles. And it, about, at the time, there's about 20 guys that would go out in these four vehicles. And we had uh, snipers with us. And so we just, the mounted or the dismounted patrol got out and we were just kind of sitting up in the middle of the desert looking out over this village about 800 meters away. And I was getting out, I was setting my guys in, you know, to get in a defensive position. And we were just gonna hang out there for a little bit and look around. And as I was setting guys in, I just hear, all of a sudden, hear this automatic gunfire coming from a long way away. And then I'll just see this dust popping up all around me. You can hear the ricochet of the bullets. And I got super excited, super excited. So I lay down, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to get positive ID and all this stuff. And, and there was a herd of sheep about 750 yards away at the time. And I thought they were shooting from behind these sheep. So I just started pulling the trigger into this huge herd of sheep <laughs> from about 800 meters away. Luckily, I'm such, it wasn't a, I was so excited, I, didn't, I don't think I hit anything. But it turns out that they were shooting from behind this building. It was two guys, one with a Mosin Nagant, one with an AK. But they were so smart, the Taliban were so smart. And they knew we were new. And, uh, and my staff sergeant at the time that went out, he was, a, he went, he was in Garmshire in the Battle for Marja, he was very experienced. And uh, he kind of chewed my butt a little bit for returning fire because then we'd have to go down there and do a battle damage assessment. Mm. And so we did, and I, was, and I stayed dismounted myself and another Marine. And uh, so the MRAPs and the MATVs took off and we left the snipers up on this position. And as the MATV was taken off, I was using the MATV as cover. I was walking right behind it. All of a sudden, I just see this huge cloud of smoke just go up from behind this MATV. And uh, turns out, I didn't know it at the time that it was an 80 pounder, 80 pound IED. Wow. Just the initiator went off. And I was a good just maybe 10 feet behind the MATV when it hit it. And I had no clue. I just thought it was a smoke from the MATV. Because I found out it was an actual 80 pounder. The next day, our company executive officer, I think, in an attempt to get his combat action ribbon, went out there to uh, try and get in a gunfight. They hit that. Uh, same IED and it, luckily no one got injured, but it tore up the MRAP pretty good in mm. the same exact spot because we marked it. So I dodged one bullet there. I got a, a, extremely lucky to not, yeah. not get injured. Wow. And then uh, as we went down to do that battle damage assessment, you know, this is all right after that the initiator went off. We're just all standing around, you know, talking to the locals and all of a sudden you just hear this loud boom go off. And, you know, the sound of, it was an RPG being fired at us or at another one of the vehicles. And that was probably the scariest sound I'd ever heard. That was the first time I'd ever heard an RPG. And, you know, and like in the movies, you know, you hear someone, or on the video games, you hear someone yell, RPG, and that was me. I got to do it. I got to say RPG. And then everybody starts freaking out, and they run, in, run inside this building, you know, to get cover. And then the local nationals freaking out because he didn't put all his wives and women away and you can't see the women and anyway we didn't we didn't care and so what they had done is the Taliban were getting to where they were so good they they would shoot at us take little pop shots and then they would lure us in and then try and make us hit IEDs which for some reason we would have but and then only the initiator went off and they were going to hit us with an RPG and I got very, very lucky. Wow. A lot of my Marines during that deployment would hang around me, even though we would get shot at, they knew for a fact that they would not get hit. Yeah. So, I, um, and I was always the lead vehicle. I was mm. always the lead vehicle, I would make the routes, I was a corporal, we had a lieutenant with us at all times. 
And I was always, I was always pretty much, it was on my shoulders to make sure that the 19 other guys, you know, made it back. Yeah. Obviously you have other people that, that help out with that too. And we had some amazing drivers as well. And um, so I would always pick the routes and my section was the only section at the time to not hit an IED. Yeah. None of us hit. Wow. Now on that note though, we flipped two MRAPs oh, two shit. days back to back. Oh no. The first one, my driver, Hash, he, uh, we were just getting through with a, a three day op. We were out in, the, out in the field. We were actually aiding another company to free people from a Taliban jail cell. And there's this big Taliban jail cell. Alpha Company, my company, set up a perimeter. Charlie Company would come in and we end up catching one of the uh, CIA top three CIA watch list um, Taliban at the time. No shit. Literally, he came up, shook the hand of one of the Marines. The Marine asked his name, and he remembered. His name was Dukes. He remembered. He was a. He was a. He wasn't an intelligence guy, but he was a click Marine, and uh, he shook hands with this guy and uh, remembered the name so well. And he's like, "I know you." Arrested him, took him back. Turned out to be one of the top three. The guy used his own name, didn't he? The know guy used his own Muhammad? name. So there's some things they're real smart with, and then That's well, you know crazy. everyone's Muhammad. Yeah. But he had a different last name that made him stand out, and he remembered his face. Right. And it turned out it was him. So that all happened on that op. Then on the way back from that that op, we were trying to come in the front gate of Leatherneck, and it was dark. And in the front gate of Leatherneck, it's just a shit show. Mm -hmm. You have all these tanker trucks, all the Afghans trying to get in bring fuel to the base, all these logistics runs. And we knew if we stand behind these tanker trucks, a good chance a V-bid would come in and take out our entire section. So my driver, Hash, you know, he was, he was excellent at what he did. He went to go around this truck and we have a, a mine roller on the front, which is about 10,000 pounds. And um, it's still very dusty. And then another car with a civilian and it came head on to us. And instead of running that car over, he wanted to avoid it, and he went and steered the wheel left, and that mine roller just took us right down in the ditch, and we just kind of toppled over. But unfortunately, it was like $250,000 in damage. Damn. And then the following day, my lieutenant was the uh, vehicle commander, and I was still the lead vehicle, and he was in the third vehicle, which was an MRAP again. And we were going out on patrol, and... There was this giant cliff off to our right side, and as I pass it, you know, I let everyone know, hey, there's a giant cliff, be careful. Well, after the first two vehicles passed, that third one, unfortunately, I guess the gravel kind of just broke, and the third vehicle just flipped over. Mm. And then we were stranded in the middle with all these housing. You can see all the motorcycles starting to go. The Taliban are starting to try to set it in to um, probably do an ambush on us. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to call for QRF, and QRF was already out you know, aiding another company because they were in a firefight and we were stuck. And so luckily all our drivers were country boys. They know how to drive tractors. Hmm. They know how to get out of sticky situations, stuck in the mud. So we were able to get a hold of another section that was out there, another four vehicles that came over and my driver Hash, with the help of a guy named Silas Hall, who was from Kentucky and Hash was from Virginia, they hooked up these chains to this giant MRAP. They took two mat Vs on each side, hooked these chains up where they were able to get it back up. Wow. And we were able to drive back. They saved our butt wow. many, many, many times. Nice. But unfortunately, in two days in a row, you know, you flip two vehicles, we got grounded. Yeah. <laughs> so we were, we were stuck on base for a little while. And um, during that time, it was also part of our mission to train the local Afghan forces. Mm -hmm. And what we would do there is, Recon at the time, there was a recon element. About three or four guys from recon would go out and train a platoon of Afghanis. And uh, it was mainly just M16 shooting on the rifle range. And uh, what we would do is we would go out provide security, my element. So we would just, because they were out just on the outskirts of base. So if Taliban wanted to come and mm -hmm. do something, you know, they needed someone there to provide security. But anyway, there was this platoon of about 40 Afghanis. And uh, there we were, we're just complacent, standing there, you know, talking shit and probably should have been paying a little bit more attention, but 
We weren't, so the Afghans were about to uh, do a final confirmation fire. So they had a full magazine. They were shooting M16s. And so while we're standing there, they start to shoot, and then there's one guy, and I still remember his name, an Afghan. His name was Private Shab Abdul. He jumps up, turns around like a little spider monkey, and just starts spraying in our direction. I had literally two Marines five feet behind him that he missed. How that happened? I don't know. That's why I'm telling you. Someone was certainly looking out wow. for me in my section. So I'm very grateful for that. And I had bullets go right over me and my buddy's heads, hitting the wall right behind us from this guy. And then we ended up shooting the guy 62 times. Because, you know, so you're trigger just, happy. He, you're, he just turned. He just turned on us. Oh, and we were thinking shit. it was going to be the whole platoon of <clears throat> Afghanis. But luckily, all 62 rounds hit that one Afghani. Because, you know, you stand pretty close to each other when you're on the firing line. Shooting rifle range. Well, we only hit that one guy, and then uh, two how other. People, how many people shot at him? Do you know, <laughs> it's like eight of us. Fuck. We were just bored and, 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 and trigger and he, happy, and well, he's the only one that got hit though. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. out of that line, but now two other guys ran. Mm -hmm. Two other guys ran, and we didn't know if they were good or bad. So I just had my machine gunner just open up. Luckily, they just got injured. They never got. They didn't get killed. Mm -hmm. But um, during that time, I, that was the first insider attack, technically an insider attack on Cam Leatherneck, and it was considered a, uh, a blue on green incident. Mm -hmm. So we got uh, interviewed by NCIS, and oh, luckily wow. we were found of, you know, innocent of any wrongdoing yeah. or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that last deployment in 2013 to 14 <laughs> was uh, the most combat experience that I uh, witnessed and unfortunately during that time we also lost a couple marines mm -hmm. um within the first three weeks of being on that deployment unfortunately we lost one of the marines to a suicide bomber mm. uh, two of my buddies went in the the front door suicide bomber wasn't even in his house came in the back and detonated and the marine would have been fine unfortunately one of the pieces of shrapnel went right underneath his helmet and mm. and uh, he was just a kid 19 years old and Kind of a sad deal. And then another one, uh, another Marine was hit in the side by a sniper out on an op from another company, Bravo Company. And then another Marine that was with uh, Motor T was doing a logistics run. Unfortunately, a V-bid hit their convoy and, and he ended up getting killed. Um, so three KIA and we had numerous injuries uh, during that deployment, wounded. But uh, other than that, I mean, Unfortunately, with that deployment, after that third week when that Marine was killed by that suicide bomber, kind of questioned why I was even there in the first place. Mm. Kind of didn't, didn't really know what the whole point of it was, especially if we had spent all that time there already. The Taliban had already started coming in and taking back all the patrol bases. The Afghan army at the time wasn't holding their own. They didn't care. As soon as the money stopped coming, they, they gave up and joined the Taliban. And uh, so... That was kind of a very disheartening, but you know, when you're in deployment, you're not there because, I mean, you are there because your country tells you to go, but yeah. <clears throat> in that kind of war, when you don't know who is who, you just fight for your buddy. You know, you're there with your buddies and, you know, and that's actually one of the things that I missed the most was that camaraderie, that brotherhood, mm -hmm. even though you're in the middle of a war zone and probably the worst of times. You know, you can fall back on each other, and um, that's probably the biggest thing that I missed the most about getting out was was that those relationships that you form when you're actually in the Marines, yeah. and yeah. you go through those trying times together. Mm. And I'm sure many other veterans can relate to that. So that was my second tour in Afghanistan. Right. Now, in between those two, I did a, a tour to Kuwait, and during that that. Um, that tour really it was nothing but you know eating food trying to get as big as possible and standing yeah. post for for the air wing and uh, there's a lot of there's some stories with that so a lot of the Marines will get a kick out of this so during that that deployment um, all we did mainly was stand post now we had uh, it wasn't a full platoon we had about 25 guys we were just augmented to the air wing mm -hmm. and uh, our chain of command, we had a lieutenant and a staff sergeant, just like any normal infantry platoon did. Um, 
they would always say, hey, don't mess with the, the women. Don't mess with the women in the air wing. Don't even talk to them. Don't touch them. Well, my platoon, turns out, my lieutenant and my staff sergeant ended up having an affair with the same girl from the air wing, a sergeant, at the same time, but they both didn't know it. So my oh. platoon commander and platoon sergeant were having sex with this air wing girl at the same time without knowing it. And it came out after she had, uh, something happened and she went and reported him. And, but it turned to the lieutenant, when we were on post, he would sneak her out in the roving vehicle. He would cover up in blankets and it's our lieutenant. Yeah. We're not gonna search, search his vehicle. Right. <laughs> so what he would do is just find different pot spots on base, I guess, to go and do what they were gonna do. Wow. And uh, yeah, and they were always telling us not to mess with the girl, so then, we have no platoon sergeant, we have no platoon commander, so you have a, an experienced corporal running the platoon. And then another gunny came over, so those two got, I think, I don't know what happened to them, to be honest, court martialed and. <laughs> wow, they didn't know they were fucking the same They didn't, shit. had no Dude, clue. They were just keeping it under wraps. No, huh? and it was so funny, one of the um, <clears throat> other Marines, we got, we had, you know, access to the, the COC. And. Uh, What's that? The, the, the Command Operations Center. Mm. And that's where we would have our uh, corporal of the guard kind of sit there and he would rove around, check on all the guys on post, make sure you had everything. Well, while he was in there in the, on the laptop, he pulled up the email, the email traffic that was going between of the investigation between the lieutenant, the staff sergeant, and that girl from the air wing. And uh, he decided to download it on a disc. <laughs> And so we, we got this on the disc and we would share it around to all the Marines. It's probably oh, still out there no. somewhere. So <laughs> but that, that was, that was hilarious. Oh. And then that was in 2012. So we did six months there. And then right before going back to my second tour in Afghanistan, um, we did mountain warfare training and we had heard about it. We knew about it. We were getting ready for it. And you got a lot of country boys in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, going up into the mountains, learning how to ski for the first time and live in the snow. I mean, it was great training, but it was probably the worst time of my life and the worst experience I had in the military. Mm. They, uh, they used our unit, and I'm sure they still do, they use our unit as what not to do while you're in Bridgeport. Mm. At the time, we had a new battalion commander, and he was, I believe he was a, meant the right thing, and I believed he was a good man, but Sometimes I just felt like he didn't really care about us. And so the uh, instructors for the Mountain Warfare Training Center usually don't carry sappies and really heavy packs while you're skiing up these, these hills. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would carry one sappy, our rifle, like 40 to 50 pounds of gear, trying to learn to ski up all these hills. And unfortunately, a lot of Marines were getting frostbitten. A lot of Marines were getting really seriously injured. That first day we went up the mountain, we had 86 casualties in a training evolution. Yeah, what? it was bad. Wow. 86. My Sergeant Major had a heart attack. One of our um, you know, most experienced sergeants who we had the most respect for, his hip came completely out of socket from trying to carry all that heavy weight up these mountain, up these hills. And anyone that's been to Bridgeport knows what I'm talking about for mountain warfare training. And it was just not a, not a good time. 86? 86, 86, the first day. Holy shit. And it was so bad that guys were like cutting themselves, trying to get out of the field. They were purposely sticking their hands in snow to get frostbite to get out of the field. Wow. Um, it, was, it was miserable. And it wouldn't have been so bad if we didn't have to carry all that excess equipment. Mm -hmm. But anyway, at the end of Bridgeport, you go down and you do um, a desert operation in Hawthorne, Nevada. And uh, it's about a week long. And I was chosen to become a range safety officer um, for that evolution. So each company, Alpha Bravo, Charlie, and Weapons would go through and do this training evolution in the desert. So you're going from extreme cold, negative 15, down to 60, 70 degrees in Hawthorne, Nevada. And uh, my company, Alpha Company, while I'm the range safety officer, was the last company to do this uh, fire maneuver range. And um, it was nighttime. We were doing the live fire night range. And I was, you had uh, one range sa safety officer up on a hill for the mortars. You had mortars that were gonna shoot. And then once the mortars were done firing, 
you had the maneuver element come in and they were going to assault on the objective and, and finish the range. Well, I was on the, I was with the assault element um, down in this ditch off to about, I'd say, 100 yards below the hill where the mortar team was set up. And uh, right before they were about to shoot, I think they were towards the middle of shooting all their mortars, you just see this massive explosion of sparks, at least from my, my view. And then over the radio, as a range safety officer, I have a radio. And uh, I hear mass cast, so I'm like, okay, maybe this is just a training. So I sent my, a couple of my buddies who are combat lifesaver up, up the hill. They went up there, and then I didn't hear from them again uh, for, I'd say, about three or four minutes. So my company commander, company first sergeant, with me being the range safety officer, I was responsible for making sure everyone was safe. And so I had to escort my company commander, company first sergeant around that hill where the mortar team was. And as I did that, I get to the other side and um, just uh, the worst, worst scene in my life. Unfortunately, seven of my really good friends and a lot of friends of a lot of my Marines and were killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up having to, we couldn't really make out who most of them were and um, so we were, seven of them ended up getting killed and then eight of them ended up, uh, seriously, seriously injured. And, uh, during that whole evolution thing, I'd never experienced anything like that. And I'm sure a lot of us didn't. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of really good men and brave men up there that day that really helped out and saved lives. And, um, I kind of froze. When I first saw that, and I'm talking to other guys, I'm like, who is this? And in my mind, I knew who the names were and, and the bodies were, and I just didn't want to admit it, and it almost just seemed like a horror movie. Mm. It was a horror movie, and you just don't, I just didn't know how to react to something like that, and all of a sudden, you know, everyone starts coming in. We're having to call in a helo from Reno to come in and then luckily the army had medics come out and during that time I'm doing what I can and there's people all over the place trying to help guys and some of the guys that were just injured just had really bad shrapnel wounds so I'd stick tourniquets on, on some guys and um, uh, one of our Navy corpsmen during that evolution he was unfortunately injured in his jaw and uh, this guy is such a badass that while his jaw was, was injured, uh, he was holding his own tongue, not really able to speak, and he was still being a Navy corpsman, pointing, telling him to help these guys out as he's sitting there holding with blood dripping down. Like holding it like... He was holding his tongue. His jaw was completely gone. Oh, man. He was holding his tongue, and I believe he had shrapnel in his eye as well, and he was coherent enough and aware enough to still tell people what... He couldn't talk, but... He was still telling people what to do wow. and who to save and who to help. And another Marine that was injured, unfortunately, uh, had just really bad trauma to his face. And he was actually, he was one of the funniest guys I'd ever met. He was cracking jokes, you know, he was still talking to him. And we while were, he was injured, he still While cracking he was injured, he was cracking jokes. That's the kind of guy he was, wow. you know. Um, I'm just not going to name names just yeah. for safety reasons and out of respect for those guys, but uh, he was still cracking jokes and we were calling in the helo and the helo got lost. Mm. So they couldn't find us. So I had to go set up this makeshift, I guess you call it landing zone with markers and chem lights and, and whatnot. It took about a good hour after all this had happened um, for the helo to get there. Oh man. And unfortunately that Marine that was joking around on the helicopter passed away. Oh. And then the Navy corpsman, he lived, and he's, he's still doing good now. And then while all that, while we're waiting on the helo to go, uh, another one of my, my buddies who was seriously injured who ended up passing away, I was, we were trying to, you know, help resuscitate him, and I'm sitting there holding his hand, and he's still kicking him, I mean, literally kicking, trying to, I guess he just, he couldn't breathe, and he was just, the, the noises he was making was just anything like that. Mm. Didn't even look the same. It didn't look the same guy, and he was a very happy, go lucky guy. Didn't didn't deserve that 
at all. And unfortunately, he died while I was holding his hand. And um, took about another hour and cleaned up, cleaned up all the bodies and got everyone out of there. And during that range that night, it was just kind of, we were sleeping out at the range that night and uh, kind of just a really eerie feeling. You had guys screaming and hollering on one side and punching things. You had guys crying on the other. Everyone's trying to mm. deal with it their, their own way. And, right. and we had the chaplain come out. I mean, he didn't really know what to say either. He said some prayers for us. And so we really had to rely again on each other mm -hmm. to come together and comfort each other. And for what little sleep we did get that night in our sleeping bags, we woke up the next morning. Again, it was just a super weird feeling and we were such a good so our unit was so closely knit that another company not alpha company i was with alpha company another company came to load our equipment for us so we didn't have to mm. and they just said hey you guys get on the bus go back to base camp we're gonna take care of your guys stuff you know and so we did and then when we went back to bridgeport you know, that was kind of the end of the entire training evolution and we were just waiting to go home and I volunteered to stay back and stay in Reno with the eight Marines that uh, had been injured. And um, during that time, I was witnessing the, the Navy Corps and his surgery and uh, the staff at the hospital there in Reno were just so amazing, so welcoming, you know, really took care of us and made sure we had everything we needed. and. The 2nd Marine Division Commander, General Lukeman at the time, and the Sergeant Major came all the way out to speak with us and hang out with us. And it was just a good experience to see the, the whole community, people we didn't even know, come and, wow, and uh, help us out and help my Marine buddies out during that time. And, uh, and this was all in 2013, and we were due to deploy to Afghanistan three months later. Oh, wow for our last time. And during that time, it, that three months after this whole training incident occurred, it was kind of a, we went through a lot of changeover in command because I'm a battalion commander, battalion, battalion commander, battalion gunner, company commander, all got relieved. And uh, the day they got relieved, you know, interestingly enough, it was NCO day, mm -hmm. meaning the NCOs were in charge of the entire battalion that day. Well, all the officers and staff NCOs went out to play golf. And we, we, the NCO stayed back and took care of business that day. And come to find out, the General Lukeman came during that day. And while the NCOs were in charge, the company commander and battalion commander and battalion uh, gunner got relieved uh, on that day. And then um, we were really struggling with, <clears throat> I guess, try, my company trying to find ourselves again and get back into the mindset because a lot of us had just given up. A lot of guys really were just getting out and transferring out of the unit, didn't want to do anything. And luckily we were able to get enough Marines back together again. And we went and did uh, ITX training out of Mojave, Mojave mm. Viper. And we did all that and deployed for that, that final deployment in 2013. And uh, I'd say we had a fairly successful deployment despite of what had just occurred prior yeah. to that. So uh, I think it was those guys, you know how I said, like I had an angel. Mm -hmm. So I really believe it was those guys oh, yeah. watching out for me, you know, watching wow. out for everyone. That just gave me in, the chills, man. Because, you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. <clears throat> right, right, right. And so this all, all this was just your first enlistment? With that your was first all my four first years? four years. Yeah, I did wow. three deployments in my first four years, yeah. which I guess is not normal. I didn't, I didn't yeah. realize that. And then you signed up again for another four, right? That's right. In 2014, while in Afghanistan, I mm -hmm. decided I didn't want to do the infantry anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, all right, I need to get a trade of some sort. And so when I decided to do get out, I uh, re-enlisted and lateral moved to 1141, which is electrician. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as I lateral moved, I was a corporal at the time, but I made the cutting score for sergeant. So I picked up sergeant right away while I was still in Afghanistan. I got stationed with 1st Bata first Combat Engineer Battalion at the time. And then uh, I was the only 1141 sergeant in that unit. So, which means that I couldn't deploy, even though I kept volunteering. I, mm. They wouldn't 
allow right. me to deploy. And I think that partially had a reason with me forming a resentment against the Marine Corps because mm. I wanted to deploy a little bit more. And uh, well, luckily for me, though, when I got out to California, I met my wife shortly after. Um, she was born and raised in San Clemente. Mm. Beautiful town. Yeah, beautiful town. And um, she's a, a horse trainer. So she was able to get me off base in the weekends, go help her out with the horses, and kind of help me feel like a normal person again. Mm. And uh, while this was all in 2014, right after that deployment, and uh, again, I'm still learning how to do my job as an electrician. I'm still learning how to be a sergeant in charge of an entire platoon. And uh, where the, I call it the bay, where all the generators were and where we worked for first combat engineer battalion was set right next to a rifle range um, in San Mateo 62 area. Mm -hmm. I was giving uh, you know the daily brief of, uh, of what we're gonna do that day and all of a sudden they start shooting the rifle range. And I heard it and I immediately take a knee and get in the prone. And I started shaking. Mm. And uh, all my Marines are laughing at me. And so that was kind of embarrassing. Mm. A couple more weeks later, I'm standing in front, and it happens again. I didn't lay down this time, get in the prone, but I, I got in, in a knee. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to another sergeant at the time. He kind of laughed at me, but he said, hey, man, you might need to go get some help. But I mean, I think it was a, a, a normal reaction after yeah. you know worrying about getting shot at for an entire deployment, it's a normal. Yeah, absolutely, that's normal. <laughs> and then, but yeah, that was, that was kind of embarrassing. And, and while you're in the Marines, especially in the infantry, you don't ever go to medical for anything. Never. Regardless of, usually, you know, obviously you got those turds who meander or malingering or whatever and try go. Try to skate out of try shit. Try to skate out of shit, yeah, mm -hmm. which is annoying. But, um, so I didn't, never went to medical, never talked to anyone about anything and, unless it was my buddies. And even then, you don't, t you don't open up much about your feelings to your buddies. Mm -hmm. And so I, I finished up, I was doing my uh, enlistment at, at Camp Pendleton. I got pretty good at my job as a sergeant, you know, doing uh, power planning for 1st Marine Division and ended up getting a couple Navy Achievement Medals, nice. which I was, was happy about. And as I was winding down in about 2016, my wife had gotten married in March of 2016. And um, I decided to uh, try my luck at joining the fire department. And here in California, you know, the, you do really well as a firefighter. You make good money back home in Georgia. Not really, you're more of a volunteer. So I was like, okay, that sounds pretty interesting. It seemed very similar to the Marines. So I signed up for, uh, to join LA City Fire. I did the whole interview process, did my CPAT, my testing and all that stuff. And this was all while I'm still active duty. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did all the hiring process. It took about two years. So literally the day I got out in 2018, I got a phone call to report to Drill, Drill Tower 40 in San Pedro for LA City Fire. I was super excited. Wow. And uh, towards the end of my enlistment, I decided to get help. Um, I went and talked to a, a Navy doctor every so often and Unfortunately, this, this Navy doctor, she, she was very sweet, and I believe she was really good at her job. Obviously, the military just throws medicine at you, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So I was going through all these different pills at the time, and um, but telling her my story about the tragedy that had happened in 2013 with my buddies that were killed made her cry. Mm. And uh, I'm like, okay, I'm just sitting there talking to her. I didn't go to her after that. I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay. So yeah. she starts crying, and I started crying a little bit, <laughs> telling her a story. It's just like a shit show. I didn't really get anywhere with that. So, so she gave me pretty much any medicine that I wanted. But So I, I was taking antidepressants at the time, and mm. uh, this is all towards the end of my enlistment again. And I, uh, right after that, I decided I'm going through with the fire department, and, and I did. And, uh, but I completely stopped taking all my medicine. And apparently that's a no-no. Um, so the fire academy for LA City is 20 weeks long, five months. Mm -hmm. I, was, I made it through the first three weeks. I made it through some of the toughest phases. And during the time in my fire academy, you know, the, the men and women there were amazing. They're very supportive of veterans and 
I believe they looked up to me as a, as a veteran, you know, for, for leadership and guidance. And I really took that to heart. I wanted to be the best. And so I put a lot of pressure on myself. I didn't want to fail my family. I didn't want to fail my wife. I didn't want to fail the Marines. Mm -hmm. And so every single day I was always putting so much pressure on myself that eventually I just kind of, I guess, snapped. I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be here on earth anymore. So I came up with a, with a plan. I was ready to uh, end my own life. And uh, so the day I decided to do it, one of the other guys in the fire academy with me asked me if I was okay. And then I broke down crying. I'm like, dude, I'm not okay. And he didn't know what to do. He was just a kid. He was just out of high school. So he's like, so he took me in and I went and talked to another one of the uh, fire cadre. He was actually a former 82nd Airborne uh, in the Army. And uh, completely just, we were right in the middle of physical training that morning and I literally just stood up after doing push ups. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm done. And I walked into the office, I spoke with uh, that firefighter, and then I broke down. It was like all the emotion I'd held in for the past eight years just came out in that one instance. I'd never cried so much in my life, but I was crying at a basic training for fire academy, which is the dream job for most people. Yeah. You know? And so for about three or four hours, I'm sitting in an office with the two fire captains who were amazing, you know, very supportive of me. And they were kind of sharing their experience with me. You know, some very similar things, how, you know, first responders can go through very, very similar things that mm -hmm. military does. And they were telling me, you know, we want you here. We want you as a firefighter. You know, we know you'd make a great firefighter. But uh, I, I was just so defeated that I just really didn't want to, didn't believe I deserved to be there, especially after breaking down like that. Mm -hmm. And so they decided, um, I decided to go to the VA after that and then that firefighter ended up taking me in the van for LA City, took me to the van directly uh, to the Long Beach VA and I checked myself in and uh, luckily I only ended up staying for one night. That was horrible. Mm. Um, the psychiatric ward there is not pretty and it's not fun. First thing they do to you when you go there is they take everything away from you. All personal belongings, your cell phone, everything. They put you in a gown with just your, your underwear on. And then they take you and put you in the back of a cop car mm. to escort you to the mental health facility. And luckily the cop there was a former Marine as well. So he didn't put me in handcuffs or anything like that. And I wasn't crazy or nothing, but I guess that was just their protocol at the time. And you have a nurse always watching you while you're just sitting there in the ER. And you know, it was just kind of de depressing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so no wonder that unfortunately Marines don't, or not just Marines, but military members don't want to go for help because it's not very welcoming. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you don't want to go there. And if you ever have experienced it, you mean, most, they'll, you know what I'm talking about. And so I went to the, the VA hospital and you're sitting in this ward and you got, you can't shower alone. You have to have someone watching you. And you're sleeping in this room with other military, and there's some people in there that definitely need to be there um, that just have nowhere else to go. A lot of homeless and people diagnosed with multiple, multiple things. And they give you, the first thing they give you when you go in there is this anxiety medicine. It's like Benadryl just to kind of calm you down, I guess, but it makes you like a zombie. And then you're, it's very regimented at what you can and can't do while you're in there, kind of like jail. Like you can only have a certain amount of time outside and you're sitting in there and the only thing they have to read is like a magazine and some um, a Bible or something like that. And so it's very, very depressing. And then you have to request to call because I didn't have any phone numbers. I didn't have my phone. Mm -hmm. So I have to request to get phone numbers off my phone to call my wife. And it's very strict with visitors and what they can and can't bring in there. But thank God I was only in there a day. The doctor was very cool with me and I, I spoke to him and let him know what was going on and he just told me, he's like, you know, I think you're just super hard on yourself and that you're just extremely tired. He's like, you just need to take it easy and relax and so that's what I did and he helped me with my VA rating. I got 
got to where I was rated a little bit more and then which really helped financially and then uh, decided to resign um, from the fire department mainly out of shame and, and guilt mm. not that I didn't necessarily n did not want to do it um, I didn't necessarily want to be a firefighter but I guess I didn't really not want to be a firefighter I knew it was a great career and uh, I think it would have been something I would have been good at but I decided not to go through with it and which put a lot of strain on my marriage and um, finances mm -hmm. and luckily at the time the situation we were in um, our landlords were very very understanding very comforting and really helped us out a lot and my family supported me quite a bit and I was so ashamed that you know I was avoiding I was avoiding my my wife I was avoiding my in-laws, because all my family's back on the East Coast in Georgia, and I'm out here in California. And I was avoiding my in-laws, avoiding my wife's clients, who are all really good friends of mine as well. And uh, to the point to where I just didn't even want to leave the house or, or do anything. So uh, luckily I was able to get through that. And um, what really helped me with that was uh, I got sober. And I got sober luckily while I was still towards the end of my career in the military. I was sober but I wasn't really working the program mm. properly. So I guess you call that dry is what most people would call that. Are you drinking? Drinking, okay. yeah. <clears throat> drinking. <clears throat> and then I, um, so during that time after the whole fire department thing I really started getting into the program of uh, AA and then I um, it kind of helped me take my mind off of all my traumatic experiences while I was in the military. It took my mind off of what happened at the fire department. And it kind of allowed me to open up a little more, to be a little more loving and a little bit more of service. And, uh, and I have a sponsor that helps me out with that. And I think that being more vulnerable, opening up and telling your story instead of what most military members do keep it all inside. I think opening up and talking about it helps a whole lot more than trying to act like the tough guy. Right. And um, now I do, I don't like the whole, you know, thank you for your service thing and because I don't believe I did anything that warrants, you know, a thank you. I don't believe I deserve any discounts or anything like that. My wife can attest to that. I will never ask for it. She'll she'll ask for it for me. <laughs> so, and uh, and what I'm getting at with that is, you know, just because I served and and did all that, I don't deserve any special treatment like anyone else. And I think, unfortunately, veterans as a whole can get to where the the whole pity me mentality. You know, feel sorry for me and mm -hmm. give me things, and uh, I didn't didn't want to do that. And I started to feel like that was becoming me. Like I needed, I deserved this because I served or mm -hmm. I deployed, you know, you owe me this, you know, thank me for my service type of attitude. And no, I didn't, I didn't believe that at all. Right. So what I did after that was I, I kind of got my, my shit together and I was able to use my GI Bill and go to school. I was trying to go to school for nursing at the time. And uh, I got all my prerequisites done. I got an associate's degree from Santa Ana College. Nice. And, uh, but unfortunately, the uh, VA wasn't able to pay for my nursing school. Mm. Um, one, due to the competitive nature of it, it was very difficult to get into public. And then two, the private school I was wanting to go to was just too expensive. Mm. So they would cover up to a certain amount, but not all of it. And uh, what I decided to do was go to uh, a different school. And um, I went to a different school and studied MRI, got through with my whole MRI degree. And while all this was going on, right after I got out in 2018 and after the whole fire department thing, um, one of my good friends, his name is Sean Fritz, he uh, got me back into playing golf again. Um, he didn't even know I played golf. He's like, hey man, why don't you just come play golf with me one day? I'm like, sure, yeah, you know, I'll dabble a little bit. He didn't know I played college golf and did the whole oh, thing. Oh, wow. So I got my old clubs back. I went and spent like $500, bought some new clubs somewhere. and. 
he saw me swinging and hitting balls. He's like, dang, man, you're pretty good. I mean, I told him, you know, I played college golf. And <clears throat> so I got back into the game um, quite a bit. I was playing three, four times a week. And nice. it kind of really uh, gave me my sense of purpose back and uh, made me happy. I found something that I was decent at, that I wanted to pursue. And um, while I was going to school for my MRI degree, I uh, started, I got my instructor certification for being a golf instructor. And I started doing that on the side a little bit. And uh, this is literally right before COVID happened, during 2019, I believe. And then, um, so COVID happened, I was teaching maybe not that many students to start with, right after COVID, or right during COVID, right in the middle of it, I would say, when everything started opening up, a huge influx of lessons, people wanting lessons, lessons, lessons. And then um, I'd always been very passionate about the game of golf. I've always been a student of the game, constantly learning. And because uh, not only does it help me, but it helps my students. So, and by me being an instructor and able to help other students, it, it helped me as well. And so uh, I started doing golf instruction full time. I do golf instruction now as a full time at San Juan Hills Golf Club, San Juan Capistrano. And I also play as well. I'm trying to play in professional events to uh, hopefully one day make it on the PGA Tour nice. to hopefully represent the veteran community. And the PGA Tour is luckily very good at supporting veterans, raising money for veterans and active duty military. And they're always giving out tickets and helping out in any way that they can. And hopefully one day when I do become a member of the PGA Tour and playing out there, I can use that platform to bring other veterans into the game of golf and hopefully help them the way it helped me. Um, and so my, my current goals are, are to do some local tournaments and do qualifiers and maybe someday get some sponsorships to be able to play some golf tournaments and, and help out some, some veterans playing golf, get more and more and slowly, but surely I am starting to get more former Marines and veterans to get out on the golf course. And we just hit golf balls and we share our experiences and I feel it makes both of us <coughs> better. Dude, that's awesome. I think there could be something really big there, you know, between golf and veterans, uh, you know, both your two passions, uh, you know, I mean, it all goes back to even before you even joined the core. You go, you yeah. know, golf has fucking been with you since what? How, how old? Eight years old. Eight years old, yeah, man. Twenty-two that's years. A, that's awesome. I think there's a, I think there's something to that. Maybe that's maybe your purpose. You know, to yeah. do something in that kind of community, golf veteran, something like that. You know, um, that's why. Well, that's awesome, man. That's one hell of a story, dude. I didn't even fucking hardly say shit this whole <laughs> this whole yeah i know the man. timeline's kind of no that was perfect man um to talk about <clears throat> yeah we'll wrap it up now um you know uh any last words though before we cut the tape i always ask uh i'll just say that if, if you're a veteran out there struggling please just reach out for help even to another even to me or urban valor I mean, we'd be happy to help yeah. you out in any way possible Absolutely. yeah Hey, well, thanks for being here, brother. One hell of a story, man. Yeah, thank you for thank doing you. this. I thanks appreciate it. Thanks for sharing, man. man. It's big time. Appreciate it. All right. Push it to the limit, I can't go no 